Right, the title of my sermon this morning is Spiritual Growth. Spiritual Growth. So I want you guys to think about your own spiritual growth this morning and reflect on how you are doing in the faith. And we're going to talk about spiritual growth. We're going to also talk about ways to increase your spiritual growth or ways to actually grow spiritually and, and look at some analogies. Now the first thing I want to say is spiritual growth it's not automatic and by I, I wish it was automatic you know don't you wish spiritual growth was automatic but you have to realize that spiritual growth is not automatic it doesn't just happen it doesn't just happen over time if you just think I've been a Christian for such and such time or I just go to church every week that doesn't necessarily mean that you are growing spiritually. You're growing at the rate you should be growing as a Christian. So we want to be growing as Christians, and it's not automatic. I mean, as we just go through 1 Thessalonians 5, I mean, if it was automatic, if you just got saved and you just started living right for God and this is changes which is happening and you're just this new creature and you don't hate the things that you used to do anymore, if it was that easy... I mean, would we get a passage like this, where Paul, how many times we read through it, Thessalonians 5 was an exhortation to do right, was an encouragement, was a rebuke, was something that we ought to be doing because we, are, we don't always do. Look, it says, Brethren, know them which labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So why is he saying that? Because often we don't always respect those that are over us in the church. So here it would be me. We don't always esteem them highly, but this is, this is a problem in every church where the leaders are taken for granted and they're not always respected the way they should. Why does he even have to mention this? Because people don't always do it. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. So there are people that are not behaving right. People don't always have the boldness to tell them off. And this is what he's saying. He Warn them that are unruly. Right? If they're not living right, to say, hey, you shouldn't be living that way. There's consequences to the way you're living. Comfort the feeble minded. So think about this. As we go through this passage, why does Paul have to tell the Thessalonians this? Because it's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. If it just happened, he would just have to say, just rest in the Lord. Just wait on the Lord and just everything just happens. No, he has to remind them. These are the things that you're not doing. This is how you walk in the faith. This is how you need to grow. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. That's something that I think very a lot of us struggle with. See that none render evil for evil. Why? Because what's our tendency? If somebody does wrong to us, we want to get back at them. We want to have revenge. We want to, we want to render evil for evil. That's our tendency in the flesh. But no, we have to walk in the Spirit. We have to none rend evil evil. Ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. Rejoice evermore. Are you always joyful? Is it just automatic to be happy? No, you have to actually purpose in your heart to dwell on the positive things and to rejoice. This is something that you need to do. This is why it's commanded to rejoice. So some people think, well, why, if I'm saved, why am I depressed? If I'm saved, why am, I why am I sad all the time? Well, it's because being happy, being joyful is actually commanded of you to be joyful. It's something that you can actually do. You can actually force yourself to walk in the Spirit and be happy about the things that you have. And oftentimes, it's because we're taking things for granted, right? We're not reflecting on the spiritual things. Pray without ceasing. When was the last time you earnestly prayed for somebody? You know, when we go through... The prayer list. You know, are these things familiar to you? Is Sunday the only time you think about these? Or do you think about your brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the week and pray for them? See, this is why it's commanded, because we don't do this automatically. In everything, give thanks. Why are we commanded to be grateful? Because we often take things for granted. We complain. We murmur. Right? We start complaining about how bad we have it in life, and yet... Do we really have it bad in life? No, we're just taking the blessings that we have for granted. We're taking our health for granted. We're taking the fact that we can see for granted. We're taking the fact that we can walk, that you can even be in church this morning. We take all these things for granted. 
That's why Paul says, hey, give thanks. Make sure you're grateful for the things you have so you're reminded as well for the things that God gives you. Quench not the Spirit. So you see, even the Spirit of God in you can be quenched. It can be resisted. Right? God may prompt you to do something, but you can say no. Right? That's why it's not automatic that you're growing. Despise not prophesying. What is that talking about? When people are preaching the Word of God, that you have an attitude of like, oh, that verse again. You know, when you start to despise the teachings of God and the teaching from the Bible. Prove all things. So you see how that's a command as well. It's a command for you to test your own faith, to test what you know, to test what you believe. You ought not have the mindset. What the tendency of the Christian is to have the mindset as, oh, that's what Victor told, that's what I believe, or that's what I heard, that's what I believe, that's what I was taught, that's what somebody told me. No, no, prove all things. Look into it. Test it. Make sure what you believe is right. Make sure you're reading the Bible. Hold fast that which is good. So you hold on to those, the things that are right, once you've proven them. Abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace. Sanctify you wholly. So this is a good one. It's not just to abstain from evil, but to abstain from the appearance of evil. So we need to think about how do we appear to other people. That needs to be part of our consideration as well as what actually is sinful. So you might go, well, what I'm doing is not sinful, but what impression are you giving other people as well? You need to think about these things and consider it. Yeah, it doesn't control everything we do, but we try to abstain from it if it appears to be evil as well. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. Faithful uh, is he will do it. Brethren, pray for us. I just wanted to get to this one. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. And we've got to get... i, I got to grow on that one. I'm not a very kissy, huggy person. But, um, you know, I don't turn them down. Like, when people, like, you know, they want to give me a hug or they, they kiss me on the cheek, I just... I'm trying to embrace that a bit more because every time I read through this passage, I'm convicted, you know, because I'm just like, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't kiss people enough. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, then, great start. So, man, I wish it was automatic. I wish, I wish growing in the Spirit was automatic, but it's not, is it? It's not automatic. It's something that you have to purpose to do. And that's why the Bible is full of these things, where the, it's commanding you to do these things, um, because it's not automatic. Now, experience alone should teach you that doing the right thing is a struggle. But why do people still teach that, you know, you get saved, you just live right, and, you know, there'll be change in your life? Because experience alone, just you living the Christian life, you know, man, this is a struggle to do what's right. I struggle to, to, to work hard. I struggle to read the Bible. I struggle to, like, do the work of God. It is a struggle. And the people that think it's just automatic, all they are is they're deceiving themselves. They've deceived themselves that they think that everything is just, everything's just easy. And look at what 1 John 1 says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And honestly, if somebody has that mindset that they think that living the Christian life is just going to be a breeze, it's going to be easy, they're setting themselves up for a fall. Look at what it says here in 1 Corinthians 10. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall. See, if you ever get to the point in your spiritual life where you think, hey, I've, I've got it all together. I'm, I'm smooth. I'm smooth sailing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm all good. You know, I've got this. That's the mindset that's very dangerous. If you get to that point in your spiritual life, because if you think you're standing, the Bible says, hey, you better take heed lest you fall because you're not ready for the struggle that in inevitably is part of the Christian life. Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. I love this passage because it teaches us that no matter what you're going through, you're not the only one that has ever gone through it. Right? This Bible says here that hey, there's nothing that you are being tried with that isn't just common to everyone else. You think, oh, nobody understands this. Nobody understands it. I, like, well, I've got it worse than everyone else. No. Because what you go through many people it's common common to man but look at this but god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able so it's comforting to know that no matter what hardship you go through you will never 
be tried with something that God knows that you can overcome. You can get over this. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So notice here that God doesn't remove the temptation. So the way that God provides the escape is not that he takes it away from you. He provides a way for you to overcome it. So you see how we are tried in our Christian life. And you need to expect it. If you just think your Christian life is going to be a bed of roses, that it's just going to be easy sailing, you're deceiving yourself. Because the truth of the Christian life is it's difficult. And you need to know that these trials and temptations are going to try your faith and test and prove you whether or not you love the Lord or not. They're going to come. But God doesn't just take away the trial. He doesn't just take away the temptation. He gives you a way out, a way to escape it, to overcome it. He doesn't just remove that temptation or that trial completely. So this idea that you get saved and you'll just have you know, new desires and behavior, the problem is that's only half the truth. And when you only know and believe half the truth, you're not getting the full picture and you're going to set yourself up for a fall. Because look at what it says here in Galatians 5. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. See, so why would we have to be commanded to walk in the Spirit if it was just automatic? If we just got saved, now we have the Spirit, man, we're going to be walking in the Spirit. We wouldn't need to be told to walk in the Spirit. But that's not the reality of it. The reality of it is you need to be told and reminded again, hey, you need to walk in the Spirit. And guys, it's not automatic. So you need to purpose to do it. If you just cruise through your spiritual life, you will not be growing. And you're going to look back at your life a year ago, two years ago, and you're going to be moving nowhere. And in fact, the danger is you're going to be going backwards. And that's the thing about the spiritual life. Right? And we, and I won't read the rest of it, but you know about the spirit and the flesh. And you know, this is the, this is the issue. I'll just skip over these verses for sake of time. This is the issue with spiritual growth. It's not automatic, but you have to realize spiritual growth is not just based on time. It's not just you've been a Christian for X amount of years and therefore you're growing. See, that's how it works physically. Physically, whether you do anything or not, you just keep getting older and older and older. It's one of the curses of this world, right? There's nothing you can do about it. Time keeps going on. You just keep getting older and older and older. And as you grow older, you get more experience in life and whatnot. But that's not how it works with your spiritual life. With your spiritual life, if you don't do anything about your spiritual life, that time means nothing. You can, and that's why people can be in church for years and years and years, for decades, and yet they're still a babe in Christ. Because it's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. Look at what it says here in James 1. This is a very familiar passage. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And notice, see, people think they have no sin. They're deceiving their own selves. They think they're all good spiritually. They think they're more spiritual than others, right? They're deceiving their own selves. They think they're all good. It's the same when you just hear the word all the time. When you're in church, you're hearing the preaching, you're listening to sermons, but if you never put it into practice, do you realize that you're deceiving your own self? You think, you think why are you deceiving your own self? Because you think you're more spiritual than you are. You think you're growing. Man, I'm learning. I'm hearing these things. But why are you deceived? Because you're not actually growing in the faith when you're not actually doing it. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So what is it saying? It looks, you're like a person that looks at themselves in the mirror. We've got a mirror at the back there. This is a good object lesson. You've got a mirror at the back. So now every time you look at that mirror, you've got to think, man, am I going to be a doer of the word or a hearer? Uh, you know, a hearer only. You're like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So he's saying when you hear the word, you don't do it. It's like you look at yourself in the mirror, you look terrible, but then you just completely forget what you just saw in the mirror. It's like in the Bible. You look in the perfect law of the Bible. You hear these things like in 1 Thessalonians 5 that I should be doing. And if you don't do it, you're like this man that looks in the mirror and just forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, this is the Bible, and continueth therein, 
He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So you see, if you hear, why are you deceiving your own selves? Because you don't retain the things you don't do. How many sermons, think about this guys, how many sermons have you listened to? Even just from me, I mean, you know, I've preached a few hundred sermons already, if you've come to church every week. Maybe you're listening to sermons online as well. How much of that information do you actually remember? But the reason why you don't remember sermons is because you don't put it into practice. Because the sermons that you heard and you put into practice, those are the ones you remember. Those are the ones that stick with you. You know, and that's why, you know, obviously you need to put yourself in this situation where you're listening to sermons. It's better to hear the word than not hear it at all. But you know what? If you don't want to be a forgetful hearer, you need to do what you hear. You need to, it's, it's got to be on purpose. It doesn't just happen. You need to purpose in your heart to say, you know what? That's something I'm not doing. I'm going to make sure I do that. And if you don't, you don't grow because you start forgetting the things that you once knew, right? And we all experience that in our spiritual life where there's so many things we knew and we forgot it because we haven't been practicing the way we should. So not only is it not, the growth in our spiritual life is not time-based. It's not just over time you just grow automatically. You can actually go backwards. And this is what's known in the Christian life as backsliding. You're backsliding when you actually go back to your old ways. You're, you're doing less than you used to. You're le doing less. And, and remember, this is not automatic. You have to purpose to do these things. Look at this in Hebrews 5. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers. So there are some of us where the time has come where we should really be teaching others. We're at the point where we know enough. Maybe you listen to my sermons and you go, Victor, I already know this stuff. Well, that's where you should start teaching others. Right? If I'm preaching week after week and you already know everything I preach, then it's time for you to start teaching others these things. Right? And it doesn't just mean from the pulpit, but you can teach others, you know, out soul winning, out, you know, discipling others, helping them understand these things. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And look at this. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So notice that they go back to being a babe. <laughs> Right? So it's not that they're a babe now because he's saying you are such as have need of strong milk. You are become such as have need of, strong, uh, of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of unrighteousness. So why? When you're unskillful at something, why? It's because you don't use it enough. You don't practice with it enough. You don't talk about it enough. You don't use it enough. And that's why you're unskillful. And when you stop doing the word, you're only hearing it, you become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use. So notice in the Christian life, in your spiritual life, it's not just this automatic, I've been a Christian for so many years, now I'm a full age. No, you can go back to being a babe, but how do you become of full age? It's those that are skillful in the word, as opposed to unskillful in the word, even those who by reason of use Right? See, the more you use the Bible, the more you teach the Bible, the more you have to explain the Bible, defend the Bible, this is how you grow in the faith. Have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So spiritual growth is not automatic. And it's not simply based on time. Just because you've been a Christian for a long time, that doesn't mean you're growing. And in fact, you may be backsliding. Right? If you know less than you used to know, if you're using, you're less involved serving God less than you used to. You're actually backslidden. You're actually going back to being a babe in Christ. And you need to stop that trend and get it moving forward. 2 Peter 3, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So two things I want to talk about when we think about growth. So in the physical world, in order to grow big and strong, there are two things you need to do. And I want to use what we know about the physical world and just in this sermon compare it to the spiritual world. Right? So the first one 
in, if you need to grow in the physical world, you need to eat, don't you? You need to eat food. And that's why babies, they start off with milk and you start eating more. If you want to grow, you need to eat. Otherwise, you'll starve to death. And in the, in the spiritual life, it's the same. Right? You need to be eating spiritual food. James 2, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warned and filled, notwithstanding, give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So even the Bible talks about food, it's a daily thing. When we know we eat breakfast, lunch and dinner, you know, those of us in, the, in, our, in, in our country where we're prosperous, man, we get snacks as well. You know, maybe you wake up, you get like a, the, your breakfast and then you go to work and then you eat a bowl of cereal and then you get your morning tea, cake and then lunch and then afternoon tea and then dinner and then you have your supper before you, know, you go to bed. And most, some of us eat more than three times a day. You know? But you have your daily food. In the spiritual life, it's the same, guys. You've got to have your daily food. Give us this day our daily bread. What is this daily bread in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus is talking about? What's well, the Word of God? Luke 4, when Jesus was tempted, look at what he said here. Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So just like you need to eat every day, you need to be reading your Bible every day. Just like multiple times a day. So if you wonder, why am I not growing as a Christian? Why am I not growing in my faith? Why am I backsliding? Well, ask yourself this question. Well, when was the last time you read your Bible? I don't mean really read your Bible. I don't mean like, you know, you read one verse on the wall somewhere and you're like, ah, I read my Bible for the day. I read the verse. I'm talking like you actually sat down, you're, you're focused, you read the Bible, you want to get something out of the Word, and you read it in depth, thinking about what it's trying to teach you. What that Bible... When was the last time you did that? This should be something daily. This is something you daily, you, read, you get into the Word, you read, you meditate on it. You know, you don't eat once a week, do you? So church is not enough. You can't say, well, I'm going to church every week, I'm getting my Bible. No, that's why you're not growing. If, that's all, if you think that's enough, if you think coming to church and getting the Bible reading that I do when I preach, and you think that's going to sustain your spiritual life, that's the reason why you're not growing. You know, that's because you need to be eating daily. You need to be reading the Word, meditating on it, thinking of it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. When was the last time you read your Bible? How much did you read? You need to be reading it daily. Now notice here Jesus says, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. We're going to go to that passage in Deuteronomy 8. And we're going to look at <clears throat> this story of the manna um, in, 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 uh, in oh, it's this, sorry, this is not in Deuteronomy 8. This is, this is actually a different passage that I want to show you guys. Oh, no, 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 no. yeah, yeah, this is, sorry, this is um, God telling us that he fed them with manna in the, in the Old Testament. So I'm just um, losing my place here. So when Jesus says, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, what is that is referring to, he's quoting Deuteronomy 8, which is talking about the manna that they were fed in Exodus. And I wanted to read this to you because I thought it was interesting. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And I just love this passage because this passage tells us the reason why God allows suffering into our lives. One of the reasons why he allows suffering. Why did he allow them to go through the wilderness for 40 years? Because he wanted to prove what was in their heart. And oftentimes when we go through hard times, it proves what's in our heart. What? Whether we would keep God's commandments or not. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, which he didn't, they didn't know about. And what's interesting about the manna, uh, I believe it's in Psalms, it says man did eat angel's food. And how blessed were they to eat something that no man has ever eaten before because this is food from heaven, which thou knewest not, neither did their fathers know. 
that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So in the New Testament, that, that manner in the Old Testament signifies the word of God, right? And that, that's why we can see Jesus quoting here Deuteronomy 8 when he was tempted in the garden. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is a quote from Deuteronomy 8. Now what's interesting is when we look at that story in Exodus 16, we see here that the manner they had to collect, I don't know if you're, how familiar you are with this story, but the manner they had to collect had to be collected daily. It's not something that they could collect one day of the week and it would last them the whole week. God actually made them collect the manna every day. Why? Because it was a lesson that they had to collect the manna like we collect the Bible and we feed from the Bible every day. But look at this in Exodus 16. The Lord spake unto Moses saying, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them. And that's, that's like us a lot, right? We, you know, we murmur as well. We complain about things. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall, be, ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Right, so this is a time when the Israelites are complaining. What are they complaining about? Oh, Moses, you brought us out into the wilderness here to die. You know, we don't have anything to eat. They wanted to go back. Right? They wanted to backslide. See, when you're backslidden, going back into bondage and back into slavery almost starts to feel appealing again. And you forget from where you came. You forget what manner of man you were. And it came to pass that at even, the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. So what's happening? They're complaining that they don't have this food. And God supernaturally provides for them. But notice, he didn't only supernaturally provide manna for them, he also provided quails from them, for them. So it's kind of like we would eat chicken today. They're eating quails, right? They could catch these quails. So in the evening, these flocks of quails would just appear for them to catch and to eat. So that's why they could eat. You know, like, you know we can think of eating chicken. You know, they're eating eljanas or they're eating whatever. You know, chicken at night. But in the morning, they have bread to eat. It's like we have toast in the morning. And then they could go out and they could collect the manna. And the manna is like the meal, the, the, I guess the grain, that they could go collect and grind up and they could make bread out of. And when the children of Israel saw it, so in the morning, when the frost would lie on the grass, that stuff would turn into manna. But then when the sun came up, it would melt the manna, the manna would disappear. So it's interesting that this angel's food is it's kind of like water, right? It would appear in the morning and then it would disappear. So they would only have a brief time to collect it. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, another it is manna, for they wist not what it was. And I believe, uh, I've heard people say that before, is you know, manna just means what is it or something like that in, in Hebrew. For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Now remember when we went through John 6, that this wasn't actually the bread that was being prophesied about, because the bread that was being prophesied about was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God in the flesh coming down from heaven. But the manna here, this angel's food in the Old Testament, is a picture of that heavenly bread. But it also teaches us about gathering the daily bread, right? That we need to gather in order to grow. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an oma for every man according to the number of persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. So he's saying in the morning when you see that manna, go out and gather enough for everyone. And when they did meet it with an oma, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. So what it's saying is, if you wanted to gather more for yourself, there was enough for you to gather. If you didn't want to gather that much for yourself, you can gather. So everyone could gather as much as they want. What does that mean? There's an abundance of this stuff. There's, there's more than enough to feed us. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. What is he saying here is that you don't keep it until tomorrow. You make what you need for the day, and that's all you need to make. And if you try and keep it for the morning, it's, it's not going to keep, right? Because God wanted you to collect this daily bread. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto Moses. So you see how they're disobeying God here. They're disobeying what Moses commanded them. But some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms 
and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. So you see how God's saying, go out, collect the manna, just enough for that day, and don't keep it till tomorrow. But people are not obeying God, so they keep it till tomorrow, and all the stuff that they kept, it went off, right? And it stank, and it bred worms, and it's all moldy, and whatnot. It bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. So you see, he's angry that they didn't trust, they didn't obey God to just take enough for that day. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. So you see, I'll notice here that manna is that picture that bread, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And notice in the Old Testament, when you go to that story, they had to gather this manna daily. So that's the picture to ask that, hey, you need to be reading your Bible daily, gathering this manna daily. Right, so that we don't forget, you know, because I'd say this picture is like we don't forget, you know, because it's going off in the morning. It's, it's not able to be used. What you read yesterday may, no, will not be as effective as what you read today. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, now this is where it starts to be miraculous, right, because they had this Sabbath that they had to keep. They couldn't work on the Sabbath. So it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread two almost for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. So notice here, every day they're gathering enough for just that one day, but on the sixth day, what's the sixth day? We generally think of the sixth day as Saturday, but for them, their seventh day is a Saturday, because the Saturday is the actual Sabbath. The sixth day is the Friday. So on Friday, they would gather twice as much, right? Because they have to gather as much for now two days. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and see that ye will see, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. So notice now when they gathered it on the Friday, they gathered, it, they gathered it enough and baked enough for two days. But on those two days, it didn't breed worms and stink, whereas on every other day it did. Every other day when they kept it to the next day, it bred worms and stank. They couldn't keep it, but on the sixth day it didn't, so that they would have enough to eat on the Sabbath and they wouldn't have to work. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. So he didn't even let them find it in the field. So on the seventh day when they went out to look for manna, there was no frost on the ground. So that showed them that it was actually a miraculous event that was happening. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath in it, there shall be none. And it came to pass, look at this, and it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. Don't you read, you read through the story of the Israelites and you just see yourself in, the, in that picture, that God tells us to do something and we just don't do it. <laughs> he, tell, he tells them, okay, you've got to gather it every day and don't keep it till tomorrow. They don't do that. And then he tells them, okay, on the seventh day, on the sixth day, you're going to gather twice as much and you're not going to find it out in the field. And why, why are they out trying to find it on the seventh day? You know why? Because they didn't gather twice as much on the sixth day. Because <laughs> they didn't obey God. They didn't do what they were told to gather twice as much on the sixth day. And now they don't have any food on the seventh day and they're hoping they're going out and gathering it on the seventh day. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel was called, the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So this was actually something a little bit sweet. You know, if you think about it, like a cori, if you've ever seen coriander seeds. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Now this is what's interesting. That he commanded Israel to keep, each of them, to keep a little bit of this manna as a testimony for their generations. But I guess we don't have any today, so maybe they didn't obey that. But what's interesting is he told Aaron as well to keep a bit of manna uh, as well. And I believe, I'm just going off from memory here, I believe that was one of the things in the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant had the, the two tables of stone. So remember the Ark of the Covenant was that box that 
God told them to make, and that was on top of it was the mercy seat with the two cherubims that cover it, and that represented the presence of God that was in the tabernacle, and then it was kept in the temple. Well, inside that ark of the of the of the covenant was kept some things. One of them was the two tables of stone that Moses had. Remember, he broke the first two and then he had to make them again. So those were put inside the Ark of the Covenant. Then the, the, the staff that budded, so if, you, if you've forgotten that story, that was when they were questioning, oh, why Aaron gets to be the priest and what? And they say, okay, well then bring out everyone ahead of your tribes. Everyone give me a staff. We'll put him into the tabernacle and see whichever one buds, which means it actually grows leaves and stuff on it tomorrow then we'll know which one God has chosen. And that was Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod budded, signifying that, yeah, God chose Aaron. It wasn't just Moses appointing his brother. God actually chose Aaron to be the high priest. So that was in the Ark of the Covenant too. But also what was in the Ark of the Covenant was this pot of manna, right? There's this, this bit of manna that they, they kept as a testimony of how God supernaturally fed them. So what's, what's the application? Like I said, you've got you to gotta read your Bible daily. You need to be eating daily. Church is not enough. So do what it takes. I don't know what it's going to take for you guys to read your Bible daily. Do you need to follow a plan? Everyone's different. Do you follow a plan? Do you set a certain time in the day every morning where you say, okay, 10 minutes in the morning before I eat, I'm going to read the Bible. 10 minutes at night before I go to bed, I'm committing to spend that time. Or every day I'm going to read X amount of chapters. But, it, but consistency is the key. Right? Either you follow a plan or you just read from beginning to end. I recommend for new readers, you know, you just start in the New Testament, read through it from beginning to end. When you finish reading that, go to Genesis. The Bible is in chronological order you know, to, to a large extent. So if you read through it from beginning to end, you get a good summary of how the Bible flows. That's why when, when I go through the Bible with the kids, you know, we go through one or a couple of books every week, just as a summary. I mean, we're going through the events of the Bible from creation to revelation, revelation because that's how the Bible flows. So you just need to be reading a little bit every day, just like you eat every day, multiple times a day. And that is better. Consistency is key. Why? Because it's so much easier to just do a little bit every day than to try and just like read, okay, you say like, oh, I'm not going to read throughout the week and I'm just going to read like 30 chapters on the weekend to make up for like, you know, my chapters throughout the week. You know, it's going to be so much easier just to read a couple of chapters, three chapters every day than it will be to read on the week. And you know what? You'll get to the week and it's so overwhelming to read that 30 chapters. You just end up reading none at all. So that's why it's always better. Consistency is key. This is why God says, you know, give us this day our daily bread because it's so much better to get into the habit of just reading the Bible a little bit every day and just being consistent with it. Think of it as your food. Now, just like food, physical food, you need a balanced diet, don't you? You need a balanced diet. So you can't just be eating milk all the time. You've got to be having strong meat as well. So it's the same spiritually. Why may you not be growing? You may be eating a lot, but if all you're eating is milk, if you're just gravitating towards the easy things, the easy things that you understand, you open your Bible up and you say, okay, I'll read a few chapters a day, but you just keep reading the same things every now and then, that stuff just becomes milk. The stuff that's easy to understand and you know, like, you know, in the Gospels and stuff like that. The harder things is when you get into the Epistles, the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets. You need that strong meat as well to actually try and like, to stimulate your mind. Just like you can't just grow up just drinking mummy's milk, right? You need to start eating some strong milk. That's one of the reasons why people don't grow in the faith either. They don't challenge themselves to read the harder parts of the Bible. That's why I say don't just select parts of the Bible to read when you read and think you're reading your Bible every day. It's better to read through the whole Bible and just read consistently a little bit, reading from beginning to end, because then you force yourself to read the hard bits. And yet, you know, just like a baby doesn't like eating their veggies the first time, a baby doesn't like chewing on meat the first time, but you've got to force them to do it. You have to force yourself to do it. And eventually you enjoy them, right? And you do eventually. Now, you, now if you're used to reading the Bible, you read through Daniel and it's like, it's way more interesting now because now you're reading through the second, you know, the first half of Daniel is like milk. Right? When you're reading about like Daniel and his three friends and Daniel and the lion's den. You know, you're reading in Genesis, there's like all these interesting stories. And you read through the Kings, there's all these interesting stories. 
And then you get through like the end of Daniel and it's like, whoa, whoa, like what's going on here? It's like the strong man. It's like, and you start getting to like, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. And then, so you're like, whoa, this, this is the heart. You've got to challenge yourself to get through it. Just read through it the first time. And once you read through it one time, just force yourself to read through it the second time. Force yourself to eat your veggies. You know, you don't want to be a picky eater. You know, I don't like picky eaters. I'm picky in some things and I, I sometimes, you know, I don't like, I force myself to eat it. Because I don't like being picky eaters physically because I feel like, you know, when you're a picky eater, you're very ungrateful for what you've got, you know. And I don't think being a picky eater is a good testimony and a good example we want to set for the next generation. So if you're a picky eater, you need to overcome that. We don't want our children to be complaining about the food that, you know, oh, you know, I remember I knew somebody, I won't say who they are, but I knew somebody that they, they were so picky they, they, would, they would eat, like, bro like, when it came to broccoli, they would eat the flower of the broccoli, but they would, and they would eat the stem of the broccoli, but for some reason they wouldn't eat where the broccoli forked off. <laughs> so I was just like, what? The, the people grow up with those bad habits. Why? Because the parents let them do that. So, you know, if you're a parent that's picky, you're going to allow your children to be picky, and we don't want people to be picky eaters. You don't want to be picky when it comes to eating God's word as well. You know, you need to get the good with the bad. You need to eat the milk with the strong meat. You need to eat the sweet stuff with the savory, right? Some things in the Bible are more sweet. You think about Romans 8. It's more sweet. You know, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Oh, it's so sweet. It's encouraging. You know, that's the, that's the, sweet, that's the sweet stuff in the Bible. That's like, you know, when you make like a fruit juice. You know, you eat a fruit juice, that's easy to take down. Maybe like Romans 1. That's like... Romans 1 is like the veggie juice, you know, you got to like take, you know, it's good for you, it doesn't taste as good, but you gotta, you got you to gotta take it, you got to understand this stuff, you know, like the Old Testament laws. So I feel like juicing is like going direct to God's word, right, juicing, just getting the raw sauce, you know, and sometimes you can have fruit juice, sometimes you have veggie juice, but you got to drink both, it's good for you. So it's like encouraging versus controversial truth. I also think of food like homemade versus processed. You know, what I mean by that, like homemade, if you think of homemade food, you know what ingredients are in there. That's when you read yourself, you prepare your own meals, you know what's in there, you're getting it straight, the raw ingredients. But processed foods is when you only live on preaching. I feel like preaching is like processed foods. It's not, like, it's not, it's not all bad for you, but why is it processed foods? Because it's got a lot of man's opinions mixed into it. You know, like, I'm not saying like preaching is bad. You know, just like sometimes you eat stuff and sometimes, you know, you look on the label, it's got natural colours. And you're like, oh, right, artificial flavours. You eat it every now and then. It's got preservative 223, whatever that is. You know, <laughs> sometimes you eat that stuff. It's part of your diet. It's okay. It's the same with preaching. But it shouldn't be all you eat. See, because all you eat, you get all that preservatives, all that, that processed stuff. And you, you don't, now you don't know how to differentiate between man's opinions and God's opinions, right? And we need to make sure we're eating homemade meals, homemade food, so that when we eat the processed food, you know, our body is able to take it. You're able to know what to take. You know, you eat the meat and spit out the bones, like people say. So just like eating healthy in your physical life, it can be more expensive, can't it? And what does that mean? It can take more effort to eat healthy. Just like you in your, in your spiritual life, if you want to have you want to be spiritually healthy, it takes more effort. It does. You know, because it's easy to just, people tell you what to believe. It's easy to just listen to, you know, oh, I don't want to figure it out. You just tell me what's right. Just tell me, you know, it's like counselling. Just, just tell me what to do. I don't want to think about things. I don't, I don't want things to be like grey, where there's like a choice I have to make. People, some people are just like, can you just, just tell me what I need to do? That's easier. But when you grow in the faith and you grow in wisdom, that's where it, it's a little bit more difficult. To be healthy, it takes more effort. Now, you can grow in a healthy way and you can grow in an unhealthy way. Just like physically, you can, grow in a, you can grow in a healthy way and you can grow in an unhealthy way. Exodus, uh, oh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 8, look at this. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Look, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. So what's the difference between grow? physically growing in a healthy way when you're eating and growing in an unhealthy way. That's the difference. 
exercise, right? Because if you're just eating all the time, yeah, you'll grow, but you'll start growing unhealthy, won't you? You'll start getting obese. You know, you're getting too much sweet stuff, and not enough you know, protein and strong meat. Isn't that interesting nowadays that people to lose weight, they go on the Atkins diet and it's protein and you know, it's like milk is sweet, you know, you've got the sweet things and then you've got the strong meat. <laughs> so I, I just find, I always find it interesting that when you go to the Bible, there's a lot of health advice there as, as well. But exercise. See, if you, one reason why you may not be growing as well, the way you ought to, is because you're not doing enough work. So we talked about, hey, when was the last time you read your Bible? How much did you read? How long did you read it for? Well, another factor, the second factor to have a healthy spiritual life, just like having a healthy physical life and healthy growth, is exercise, is working physically. Now, when was the last time you did something for God? If you think about the last month, when was the last time you served God in any capacity at all where you did something for God's kingdom? And how long has that been going on for? So now you can think about, well, why am, I not, why am I not experiencing a healthy spiritual life? Well, am I growing? Am I eating food daily? Am I challenging myself to learn new things? And am I now working? Am I using that knowledge? Because right, in the physical world, you're using the energy that you take up. But how do you work in the spiritual world? Well, you take in knowledge, don't you? You take in wisdom and knowledge, and then how do you work it? Now you need to disperse that knowledge. So you think about your life. Think about your last week. Think about your last month. How is it doing? First Timothy 4, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So you see, when we listen to preaching, or even when we teach it, Right? We remember these things. We're nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. But refuse profane and old wise fa fables. So that's the bad diet, right? The bad food. You've got the good food, which is the truths of God's word. But look at this. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all. So you see how the, the parallel to spiritual exercise is actually trying to be godly, actually trying to do what you hear. Preaching the word, living out what you hear, like we saw before in James 1. Not just a hearer of the word, not just eating, but a doer. So you have the food and you have the exercise. For bodily, profit, bodily exercise profiteth little. Now don't take this verse to say that it doesn't profit at all. all right? So bodily exercise does profit. And all of us should be doing some exercise. You know, a lot of us these days live too much of a, you know, placid lifestyle, right? And you're eating a lot, you're nourished up, you're nourished up with food, but if you don't get moving, right, and in this day and age, it's very easy to not move. Why? Because, you know, people, have you ever heard that saying where people say, we sleep in a box, and then you wake up and then you drive to work in a box, to sit in a box, <laughs> to do work? You can't, we constantly live in a box. You know, we're not actually moving about anymore because we've got cars, we've got transport and all this sort of stuff. So you go from one box into a box that takes you to another box and back home to a box and you never actually get out and exercise. So in our day and age, guys, like, like purposefully eating physically, you have to purposefully exercise too. You have to purposefully get yourself moving so that you keep yourself because it does profit. Exercise profits. It just profits little compared to godliness, right? Because godliness obviously is more important and it's profitable unto all things because bodily exercise just profits yourself. But godliness can profit other people through your example, through your teaching. Having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Look at this in 1 Timothy 6. Fight the good fight of faith. Now let me ask you, what, number one was food. Number two is you need to exercise now, is exercise always pleasant? No. No. Does, I mean, does anyone just think like, oh, you know, I'm going to out work? That, that's not our natural tendency. Those who enjoy exercising, it's because they've been exercising more and more, haven't they? They've gotten into the habit of exercising where they go and they actually enjoy. But you know what? Your spiritual life is exactly the same. 
You know, when you're a babe or you're like obese spiritually, you don't feel like work exercising. So that's why it's, it's ludicrous to think I'm going to serve God when I feel like it. That's like saying I'm going to go exercise when I feel like it. You know, you, exercise is hard work. It's not pleasant. You don't want to just go do it. You've got to sort of force yourself to do it. But you know what? As you get healthier, and you know how people, when they start to get healthier, they get more energy. Isn't that interesting that they start to enjoy exercising? They look forward to going to the gym. It makes them feel good. That's exactly how it is in the spiritual life. So don't get it the other way around. The other way around is like, oh, you're like, why do I feel? Like, why is my spiritual life so bad? It's because you're spiritually unhealthy. Just like when you're physically unhealthy, it's like, why do I feel so like, tired and fatigued and you know, I feel so like with no energy? It's because you're unhealthy. You know, but you need, to, you need to get healthy. You need to start eating right. You need to start moving. And it's the same in the spiritual life. Why am I spiritually unhealthy? And spiritual health is when you start backsliding. Why, when are you spiritually unhealthy? You start backsliding. You start getting back into old sins. You start dreading coming to church. You start dreading reading your Bible. Things of God don't excite you. And you're not thinking about getting people saved. Now you're thinking more about set, just setting yourself up for life. You're thinking about your career. These are indications of your spiritual health. And you're unhealthy because you haven't been eating right, you haven't been exercising. And just like eating right and exercising is not just your natural tendency to just do, you've got to force yourself to do it. It's the same in the spiritual life. You've just got to force yourself to do it. And when the more you force yourself to do it, and you start challenging yourself and setting goals and improving, and you start getting stronger spiritually, just like you got getting stronger physically, you have more energy, it's the same in your spiritual life too. You start enjoying it more. Why? Because you're actually healthy now in your spiritual life. And just like, you know, if you're not hungry for food, you know, sometimes people lose their appetite because they're not active enough. But when you get active and you start building up some strength, some muscle, what does that do to your body? It increases your metabolism, doesn't it? It increases your hunger. And I think it's the exact same in the spiritual life. Why are you not hungry for God's Word? Why do you not want to learn more? It's because you're not working, you don't work up an appetite for God's Word. And how do you work up an appetite for God's Word? You go out and you get working, you build some spiritual muscles. And how do you do that? It's when you go out and you try and preach to people. That's why preaching the gospel and soul winning is like one of the most practical, that's the most practical way, that's what the work is. You know, one, one of the works, because the other works is obviously being charitable and being godly. But when you go out and you go out and fight the good fight of faith, why does that encourage you to want to learn more? Because people ask you questions and you're like, man, that's an interesting question. I've got to figure that out. Right? And you get a, that's how you get a hunger for God's word. You go, like, man, I've never heard that before. Yeah. Somebody said that. You gotta go, you gotta look at it. You're like, oh, you know, it's, it's interesting. You ask somebody about it. Have you heard something about this? But the reason why you built up that appetite for God's word is because you tried to do something with what you had. You were trying to work, you were trying to do the fight. And just like in your physical life, when you go out and exercise, you, build, you get hungry. You've been working hard in the day, man, you get home, you're so much more hungry than if you've been doing nothing all day. It's the same in the spiritual life. You've got to build up that hunger by engaging in the fight, engaging in going out and doing the Great Commission. Right? The Great Commission, Matthew 28, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So there are three aspects to the Great Commission. Right? It's not only preaching the gospel. We want to baptize people as well, get them in church. And then we need to teach them. And everybody can be involved in the Great Commission. Teaching doesn't only come from the pulpit. When somebody comes to you and asks you a Bible question, that's part of the Great Commission. When you, hey, you're helping to help them to grow and help them understand how they're to keep that commandment. They don't always come to me. Maybe they come to you. You know, and you want to be ready for that. Or maybe you have a question. That's how you can help somebody engage in the Great Commission. You ask somebody. You know, and then that sort of, you know, with the iron sharpening iron, People helping each other to get into the fight and exhorting one another. Look, Hebrews 3. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, so how, what are some practical ways to get into the work? We talked about the Great Commission. But it's not only, don't only think of the Great Commission as 
trying to preach to other people you don't know. Because, I mean, the Great Commission is also here too. Right? So when you talk about the Bible together, when you discuss things, when we challenge one another and try and think, hey, what about this, what about that? That is also a practical way where you can get in the work. And how many times, maybe in your own personal life, you've experienced where you've gotten into a discussion with somebody at church or a Christian that you know, and that's spurred you on to learn more. So you see how that is building up your spiritual appetite when you're, in, you're, you're, you're teaching others. You're in the fight as well in terms of the Great Commission of helping others to learn, teaching yourself, learning and growing. It's all about the knowledge and how, what we do with it. Um, so you can teach others. It's not just preaching from the pulpit, speaking about it with people in church or teaching children. You know, teaching your own children at home. You know, when you make a point of it to teach your children and they ask you questions, you go find out about it. Again, this is how you build up that appetite. And you want to set goals. Well, you know, you want, to, you want to set a goal for yourself where you say, hey, you know what, I'm going to go soul winning for the first time. You know, I'm going to do it next week. Or I'm going to go, like today, like today is the day I'm going to go soul winning. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I'm going soul winning at least once, uh, once, a, once a month or, you know, wherever you want to start. But set a goal to get going. It's just like with exercise. If you just, like, purchase the gym membership... You know, but you make no time to go to the gym, you don't set it in a schedule, it's no different. So it's the same. You've got to think of your spiritual life the same way. The same way you take care of your diet. People have to take care of their diet. People take care of their body. You have to take care of your spiritual diet, taking in food every day, and then work, doing the work that you need to do for God. So just in conclusion, guys, to grow in the faith, you're going to have to eat right and you're going to have to exercise. So it's just like eating right and exercising physically. But remember, it's not always pleasant. Just like exercising physically and eating physically isn't always pleasant to start off with. But what that should tell you is that should give you a barometer of your spiritual health. Don't have it the other way around. You don't feel good. That's why you, know, you want to go out and do these things. You've got to force yourself to do it first and then you start growing and then the desire comes, right? Just like somebody who's getting healthier in real life. As they get healthier, as they get stronger, man, now they start to enjoy going to the gym. They start enjoying working out and that's exactly how it works in the spiritual life too. All right, I hope that was a blessing to you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, Lord, help us all to grow in the faith. It's not something that's easy to do, Lord. So we need your grace, we need strength from you. But help us, Lord, to, to force ourselves to do it. Let's force ourselves to walk in the Spirit. The flesh is so strong, that's why we don't want to do it, Lord. The flesh is stronger than the Spirit right now. And we, just, we want to force ourselves to walk in the Spirit. We feed the Spirit so that we can overcome uh, the works of the flesh. So help us, Lord. Uh, we need to you know, have uh, goals in our life. We need to set time away daily to, to read your word. And Lord, make it a, a purposeful act because it's not just going to happen automatically. So help us, Lord. We, just, we need your grace. It's so, so hard to do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.